Cheddar Man is the name given to 10,000-year-old human remains found in a cave in Cheddar Gorge, Somerset, England. Discovered in 1903, it is Britain's oldest near-complete human skeleton with a huge hole in his skull suggesting he died a violent death. Other remains found in the cave have been linked to cannibalistic rituals, trophy display, and a secondary burial. Cheddar Man is thought to have died in his 20s and had a relatively good diet, considering he lived in Britain when it was almost completely depopulated, with a total population of about 12,000 individuals. Although previous populations had settled in Britain long before his arrival, they were wiped out before him. The Cheddar Man marked the start of continuous habitation on the island, making him among the very first modern Britons, which is probably why his alleged phenotype is stirring up so much controversy. In 2018, some researchers claimed that they had been able to accurately reconstruct the face of the first Brit based on his DNA, proclaiming that he had black skin and blue eyes. With a pair of seemingly politically motivated paleo artists gleefully revealing a new Afrocentric model to replace the prior one, which was depicted as a traditional Western European hunter gatherer with white skin. One month later, and after considerable blowback, one of the main scientists who worked on the study says he may not have been black after all. Geneticist Susan Walsh at Indiana University, Purdue, University, Indianapolis, says we simply don't know his skin color and that DNA testing is not advanced enough to say for certain. Dr. Walsh believes that the test can't prove Cheddar Man's skin color, adding that his DNA may have degraded over the past 10,000 years. That said, the details of the study were behind a paywall, so I couldn't access it, but the Natural History Museum website cited the study and stated in their fact that the Cheddar Man's skin pigmentation was most likely one of the two most highly pigmented of five categories, which I found odd because the Fitzpatrick scale, most commonly used to determine epidermal melanin, has six categories, where the fourth and fifth types are certainly not fair, but also not black, like a Bantu sub-Saharan African. The study also did not take into account any other traditional considerations regarding recessive phenotypes, ignoring other specimen or morphology. 150 genes have now been identified as having a direct or indirect effect on skin color, and many considerations were ignored in the findings. For example, Cheddar Man also had genes that are associated with extremely light skin pigmentation and freckles in modern-day Europeans namely IRF4, which the Irish have in high frequency. And he was heterozygous for one of the red hair mutations, which in and of itself causes a lot of depigmentation. I think the authors overplayed their hand on the data and either rushed their conclusions or showed extreme bias, leading me to agree with those suspicious of a political agenda in the announcement. My own analysis of the Paleolithic, blue-eyed, Western European hunter-gatherer, including Cheddar Man, is that he looks something like this, which is based on a skull found in Latvia, of which had predominantly Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. This would account for darker hair, blue eyes, and a skin tone that would not be typically found on a red-haired ginger or blonde individual but certainly within the expected range of modern Europeans, for example, Sardinian or even North African. To better understand my assessment, let us look at what we know about the peopling of Europe by the first modern humans roughly 35,000 years ago. The first modern human discovered was Cro-Magnon, which means big cave, after the location was discovered in the Pyrenees region between France and Spain. Cro-Magnon was the only type of hominin that had a prominent chin, no protruding brow ridge, a forehead indicating a large neocortex, and a round skull shape. There are other discoveries that are considered anatomically correct, 
but that's a different term, anthropologically speaking, than fully modern, which starts with Cro-Magnon types roughly 40,000 years ago. To determine who the first modern humans to settle Europe were, scientists analyzed the genome of two skull fragments from a site in Crimea dating to 36,000 and 37,000 years ago, according to Jean Jacques Hublin, a paleoanthropologist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, quote, it's a complex story. It's not a one-way peopling of Europe by modern humans coming out of Africa, end quote. My name is Eske Villerslev. I'm the director for the Center for Geogenetics, and we are releasing a paper in Science concerning how the genetic diversity in present-day Europeans came about. We have sequenced uh, the genome of a 37,000-year-old individual from Europe, meaning it's one of the oldest modern humans found in Europe. And uh, this genome basically reveals three different things. First of all, and this is very surprising, we can see that all the major genetic components present in, in, in living day Europeans were already present in Europeans 37,000 years ago. And that changes the whole concept of how Europe was populated, where we previously thought, well, it was massive movements of people from outside into Europe providing genes. Now it is, it, it, the data suggests, no, there was like this major population of people stretching all the way from Europe to Central Asia exchanging genes in a very complex network with each other, and it's not this massive movement of people all the time going back and forth. The other thing we can see is that, that this individual is 100% European. There's no East Asian, genetically speaking, in this individual. The fact that 37,000-year-old Cro-Magnon type remains are nearly identical to modern Europeans, anatomically and genetically, and as a Western European hunter-gatherer, Cheddarman is essentially a descendant of Cro-Magnon. It should come as no surprise that Mr. Adrian Target, a history teacher in Somerset, UK, has been shown by DNA tests to be a direct descendant by his mother's line of Cheddarman. This begs the question, why does the mainstream media and woke members of post-World War II academia insist on pushing an Afrocentric narrative. Between 45,000 and 35,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans spread across Europe, while the Neanderthals, present since before 300,000 years ago, disappeared. How this process occurred has long been debated, but since the sequencing of modern human and archaic hominin genomes, we are now able to answer some of these questions. Comparisons between the Neanderthal genome and the genomes of present-day humans have shown that Neanderthals contributed approximately 1-3% to of the genomes of all people living today outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, suggesting that human populations ancestral to all non-Africans mixed with Neanderthals. We also know that Neanderthals share more alleles with East Asians and Native Americans than with Europeans and that people of sub-Saharan African descent contain up to 20% admixture from a super archaic hominin species 1.2 to 1.3 million years removed from modern human, and that is not found in the DNA of Caucasians or East Asians. That said, mainstream anthropologists have a hard time dispensing with their obsolete out-of-Africa replacement model theorizing that a black African demographic migrated out and replaced all other hominins and mutated or evolved into the other races, 
which we now know conclusively to be incorrect. One researcher that addresses this question from a Vedic perspective is Michael Cremo, who argues that humanity did not evolve from apes and is in fact descended from much older civilizations that existed in Earth's history, which came and went in a cyclical pattern, giving credence to many ancient myths and legends from antiquity. And welcome back to 43 Focus, and please welcome Michael Cremo, who is the co-author of this book, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Nice to see you, Michael. Good to be here, Gary. This, uh, I believe, calls into question Darwinian's theory of evolution. Is well, that correct? Y yes, Gary. Essentially, that theory says that human beings like us have been around for about 100,000 years. And before that, you would have had only ape-man-like creatures. Before that, apes and monkeys. Uh, what we found, however, when we looked into the entire history of archaeology, uh, my co-author and I did eight years of research. We looked at every archaeological discovery that's ever been made. And what we found is that there are hundreds of such discoveries that indicate human beings like ourselves have mm -hmm. been around for literally millions of years. What's been the reception to this, to this book? Oh, there's been, from the uh, spokespersons of the scientific establishment, there has been absolute outrage. Um, you know, for example, you know, How dare you well, come yeah. up with any kind well, of a... Well, like Richard Leakey, for example, he said this book is you know, pure humbug, nobody would take it seriously but a fool. Uh, on the other hand, we've had uh, many uh, scientists and scholars uh, say this is a wonderful book. It's really great that finally somebody has brought together all this evidence because a lot of it's not available in English. You know, we had to do eight years of research, translate papers from German, you, Russian. You, you referred to, in India, the Vedic literature? Well, what, yes. What that? I, I was saying uh, in the beginning that we do take uh, uh, our inspiration from these uh, ancient Sanskrit writings of India. Uh, they're collectively called the Vedas. Among them are the Puranas. Purana is a Sanskrit word. It means history. Now, these histories tell of human civilizations on this planet going back millions of years. How do, now, we we know thought, those are, how do we know those are accurate? Well, that was our question, too. Uh, Richard Thompson and I, we thought, well, if, if there's any accuracy to, to those statements, there, there must be some factual evidence to back them up. Now, when we looked in the current textbooks, of course, we didn't find any such evidence, but we thought, well, let's look a little bit uh, further. And as I said, that led to an eight-year research program where we investigated every archaeological discovery ever made. And what we found is, is that, practically speaking, archaeologists and anthropologists have buried almost as much evidence as they've dug up. In other or words... Or perhaps overlooked? Um, cast aside? Well, yes, cast aside. Uh, and, and, and there have been some outright cases of... Um, of a suppression where people who have reported such things have had their careers ruined. We should never, I don't think, be afraid to investigate opposing points of view. And the hidden yes. history of, of the human race uh, is something that uh, is in direct opposition, I guess, to the Darwinian theory it of, definitely of, is, of yes. evolution. And a vast amount of evidence showing that human beings like ourselves have been around for millions of years has been systematically suppressed. And I can give you some examples. Okay. For example, in 1979, Mary Leakey, who's one of the most famous archaeologists of this century, discovered in Africa completely modern human footprints, no different from the footprints that you or I would make on a beach today. Now, the thing about these footprints is they were found in rock that was dated 3.6 million years old. And that throws out completely any idea of human origins that's current today. Why would anyone want information like that suppressed? Mm -hmm. What possible advantage would there be in that? Well, power, prestige, money, there's a lot riding on it. Uh, if, any, if even one of the hundreds of cases that we document in the hidden history of the human race were found to be true, accepted, that would mean that everything we've been told about human origins and antiquity for the past 150 years is simply not true. 
and I don't think that the current establishment is ready to admit that. How long ago do you think that, that this evidence was suppressed? I mean, is this something that's been going on for, for years and years? Yes, this has been going on for about 150 years. I'll give you another example. I'd like to move along uh, here in uh, some of the additional myths that you have listed here, Michael Cremo. Uh, you have talked in terms of the uh, fact that scientists don't cheat. That's a myth. You say there's actual cheating going on. Oh, that's very well documented. For example, the, the Piltdown case is a very famous case that documents that. Now, what that has to do with is early in this century, uh, there was a purported discovery of an ape man in England uh, based on a skull and a jawbone. And this Piltdown man Piltdown Ape Man was in the science textbooks for about 40 years. And then uh, suddenly it was revealed that the British Museum had tested these fossils and determined that it was a very elaborate hoax. And many people have speculated about the identity of the person who was the hoaxer. And practically all of them center on different scientists in England, such as Sir Grafton Elliot Smith or Sir Arthur Smith Woodward, uh, all very well-established scientists in England, because only somebody who, who knew the scientific ver method very well could have prepared these fossils in such a way that they would have fooled the scientific community all around the world for 40 or 50 years. So some scientist who wanted to perhaps give some evidence in favor of evolution, because there's not very much of it, uh, invented this ape man and in a very sophisticated way uh, cheated, literally. And this is admitted by the scientists themselves. And there are more examples I could give, and we document many of them in our book, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Myth number three, um, Michael, that you have written evidence that goes against human elevation, uh, evolution is reported only by crackpots. Now this, this is one of the standard techniques that the scientific community tries to use against anybody that reports something that goes against their ideas. Uh, they try to label them in a derogatory way without actually discussing the facts. And I think we've all had experience of that. Um, but uh, the real facts are is that actual scientists have, over the past 150 years, reported many astounding facts that go against the theory of evolution. and. The present scientific community doesn't want people to know that. They want, they want to promote the idea that anybody that's against evolution is somehow or other a, a religious fanatic, a crackpot, uh, but it's simply not true. And I've, I've, had, I've personally met a scientist who have uh, discovered some of these things, and what happens to them is it's... it's uh, it's very unfair, the treatment to which they are subjected. Ron in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Ron, how are you? Yes, good evening. I, uh, I'm just going to make a question here and then hang up and listen. Obviously, your two guests do not believe that we evolved from lower primates. And like, uh, interestingly well, enough, one of them comes from a, a Judeo-Christian background and one not. Right. Now, my question is, if we did not, then where do you two people feel we did come from and I'd like some hard evidence of a Garden of Eden. Thank you. Okay. Actually, this is the subject matter of the next book that Richard Thompson and I are working on. We call it Human Devolution uh, because from the evidence that we can see, it appears that if our origin is not on this planet, we did not evolve from apes on this planet. Say if you have civilizations coming and going uh, over vast periods of time, uh, perhaps you might have humans and other uh, ape-man-like creatures coexisting. I, I will mention that the Puranas do talk about 
intelligent races of ape-like creatures uh, that use stone tools. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not an idea that came in with uh, Darwin. It's been there for thousands mm -hmm. of years. Now, what might one predict from that? Uh, if you were to predict what archaeologists might find, uh, you would say, well, they would tend to find a very bewildering mixture of anatomically modern human fossils, ape man like fossils, uh, uh, crude stone tools, uh, articles uh, indicative of a higher level, higher level of culture, all sort of mixed up and going back, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. I think you might also predict that given the uh, biases of investigators towards a linear progressive idea of time with things beginning in a very simple state and progressing in a linear fashion to a more advanced state uh, that they might edit mm -hmm. that record yeah. to conform to their linear progressive biases mm -hmm. and indeed uh, both predictions we found in our investigations do come true. You actually do have that very bewildering you know, mixture of uh, advanced artifacts and bones mixed up with more primitive ones. Mm -hmm. And you also uh, do find a very systematic editing of this record to conform to a linear, progressive, you might call it evolutionary, view of things, mm -hmm. which is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Of course, if, if we have this sort of cyclical, cyclical picture, circular yeah. picture of, of things, uh, much of uh, conventional science will need to be readjusted. And, and naturally, I suppose it's only fair to say that uh, Vedantic thought uh, has many other ideas about the nature of time and space, uh, the, the nature of spiritual dimensions. I, I believe that, that your view of things would be that rather than say that uh, humanity evolved from simple uh, celled creatures that in some sense we rather descended from spiritual planes. Uh, yes, and this, this is a matter that... Cremo brings up some interesting points. First, if there's evidence of bipedal hominins prior to seven million years ago, it throws a monkey wrench into the out of Africa model, which states that bipedalism came about five to seven million years ago. He also brings up the idea that certain elements of humanity may have devolved, which is supported anatomically, for example, with Cro-Magnon, which has a substantially greater cranial capacity than the modern average. And finally, he speaks about cyclical patterns of time on Earth, which is supported by the geological record, showing that our planet undergoes periodic global cataclysms which is also spoken about in many religions and mythologies, such as the biblical Flood of Noah, or the fabled tale of the lost empire of Atlantis. Which brings us back to the peopling of Europe, which we have established started with Cro-Magnon, the first fully modern human to inhabit Western Europe, with its oldest settlement starting in the West and moving East, which is counterintuitive if one assumes that Cro-Magnon must have originated in Africa. Please watch my latest video, Out of Africa Theory Debunked, for why I reject that model. So, if Cro-Magnon did not arise from ancestors of Sub-Saharan Africans and evolve into Asians and Caucasians, then where did he come from? Cro-Magnon's direct descendants are the Basque, which occupy an area in the Pyrenees where the first Cro-Magnon was found. Besides having a high degree of Rh negative blood, they share genetic affinities with the Guanches, the native indigenous population of the Canary Islands, which were decimated 500 years ago by the Spanish. But they left mummies and were depicted in art at the time with an uncanny resemblance to how many have portrayed the Western European hunter-gatherer populations, which gave rise to Cheddar Man. In 590 BC, an Egyptian priest of very great age told a Greek statesman, Solon, an incredible tale of ancient empires 
natural catastrophes, and a great Atlantean war. Quote, this power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to the other islands, and from these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance. But that other is a real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Now, in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others and over other parts of the continent. And furthermore, the men of Atlantis had subjugated the parts of Libya within the columns of Hercules as far as Egypt and of Europe as far as Tyrania. This vast power, gathered into one, endeavored to subdue at a blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits. And then, Solon, your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind. She was preeminent in courage and military skill and was the leader of the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason, the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Plato, 360 BC. Occurring cycle of natural disaster, recurring cycle of natural disasters. We have this kind of collective memory, if I can call it that, of a worldwide flood. While the Basque have a legend that they originally came from an island archipelago in the west that they call Atlantica, the Berbers living around Mount Atlas, who also share genetic affinities to the Basque and the Guanches of the Canary Islands, are also thought to have Atlantean ancestry, as they are considered descendants of Cro-Magnon as well. I have many videos which explore the possibility that Cro-Magnon were the Atlanteans that originally populated Europe during the Pleistocene. That said, what about modern Europeans of the Holocene, meaning the past 11,500 years, our current age? Where did they come from? And what comprises the various phenotypes that make up the modern European demographic? I think a lot of assumptions we had coming into what I had when I grew up about the relationships amongst human populations and the nature of human population structure today are fundamentally wrong. So I think a lot of us have an idea that the population structure we intuitively understand in the world today, people group, grouped into groups like people like New Guineans or different groups of Africans or you know, Caucasians or East Asians or South Asians reflect some kind of age-old population separation that's happened for, you know, the eons, right, for a very long time after a bifurcation and spreading from some common ancestral population. But that's profoundly wrong, in fact. In fact, 10,000 years ago, that structure would have been unrecognizable. And I'm going to tell you why that is, because we now know it's that so, so from ancient DNA. And the example I'm going to give is West Eurasia, 
which we know best because ancient DNA has been richest from West Eurasia, not because it's a particularly important place in the world, Europe, but because that's where the first ancient DNA studies have been, because scientists who invented this technology were largely in Europe, and that's where we have our best data. But everything that we look at suggests that the same sorts of patterns will be observed in other parts of the world as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a story we published in 2016 where we put together new data from 44 individuals from the ancient Near East. So this is places like Iran and uh, Levant, uh, Jordan and Israel, Anatolia, and uh, the northern part of the Levant, which is, for example, uh, of the Near East, uh, Caucasus, <laughs> Armenia. So we combine that data with previous data from the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Sea in present-day Russia and also many samples from Europe that we had data from to try to understand the nature of the human population structure that existed over the last 15,000 years, which was the period over which we were able to interrogate whole genome sequences from this time. And so this picture shows the different places, the Levant, Iran, uh, Anatolia, present-day Turkey, uh, the Caucasus where Armenia is, um, and uh, mainland Europe, and, um, and, and the steppe, um, where each of which we had samples at different points in time. And what you can see from the genetic data is the following. This is what happened. 10,000 years ago, we actually have real genetic data, whole ancient genomes of similar quality to modern genome sequence for medical studies from four populations. Um, Iranian farmers who lived around this time, Levantine farmers who lived in Jordan um, and Israel, uh, Western hunter-gatherers who lived in the far west of Europe, Eastern hunter-gatherers who lived in the far east of Europe, each of these groups was as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians are today. And what happened is that none of them disappeared, but they all mixed each with other profoundly. And what you actually see in this region today is mixtures in different proportions of these four source populations with small additional contributions from other groups. But these are the primary sources of ancestry across this vast region. And it's this blurring that creates this relative sense of sameness that we see today. So I wanted, this is a critique of your people's, people's picture of, quote, racial structure today that I think was not really in people's heads before. There are many good critiques of that, but one of them that was not in people's heads was the idea that 10,000 years ago, if you had made such a categorization, it would be completely different from what it is today. So the third thing I wanted to tell you about before I close, and maybe we can have a conversation, um, is um, how ancient DNA has yielded a great surprise with regard to an age-old, more than 200-year-old question, which is, how did the languages that we happen to speak in this country come to be? So in uh, 230 years ago, uh, William Jones, a British colonial justice uh, who was serving in present-day Calcutta, um, in the Cal city of Calcutta, um, and was, had been trained in his school days in Latin and Greek and was a polylinguist, was one of these amazing people who knew many languages. He was interested also in the local, um, uh, the local scriptural languages. And when he studied Sanskrit, he said the following. The Sanskrit language, whatever may be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity both in the roots of verbs and in the forms of grammar than could possibly have been produced by accident, so strong indeed that no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source which perhaps no longer exists. So this was one of the first articulations of the Indo-European problem. It was not the first, but it was one of the first. And it's the observation that almost all the languages of Europe today, ex with the exception of Hungarian, Finnish, Estonian, and Basque, and Sami, and as well as Iranian and Northern Indian languages and Armenian are all, are all very similar, are all stem clearly from the same root. Since that observation, there have been ancient texts in ancient Hittite, uh, which was a language spoken in present day in, in Turkey, in the ancient Turkey, about 30, three, three to 4,000 years ago, which show that that too was an Indo-European language is. And there's an ancient language called Tocharian that used to be spoken in the Tarim Basin of China, which was also Indo-European, but is now also extinct. So one of the leading hypotheses is that Indo-European languages spread with the spread of agriculture, which, as I mentioned to you, 
was developed 11 to 12,000 years ago and then exploded out of the Near East after 9,000 years ago, almost simultaneously into Europe from Anatolia and into South Asia from Iran. The alternative hypothesis was something known as the steppe hypothesis. The steppe hypothesis of Indo-European origins is, mo is motivated by a very different observation, and it's motivated mostly by language. So there are many arguments for the steppe hypothesis, but I'll give you one particularly interesting one. In all of these Indo-European languages, with the exception of ancient Hittite, which is the ancient earliest branching of them, there is a common shared vocabulary for axles, wheels, and some vocabulary for horses. And what this suggests is that the common ancestral population knew of these things, knew of wheels, knew of carts. So that's the steppe hypothesis. And there's a particular group of people um, called the Yamnaya. So the Yamnaya are steppe pastoralists who were the first people of the open steppe who used this extraordinary technology of wheels and horses to spread. So prior to the Yamnaya, there were many isolated populations living in the river valleys north of the Black and Caspian Seas. They made different types of pots and stone tools, and each one was different from the other. But after about 5,000 years ago, this Yamnaya group spread and displaced almost all of them. The villages of these groups disappeared. There were almost no more villages. And instead, what you see is great tombs only with very few villages or no villages, often buried with horses or carts inside of them. And the archaeological interpretation is that these people had learned how to take their supplies out into the open steppe. And they were living an ancient version of mobile homes. They were taking their water out into the steppe. And they were exploiting the vast landscapes that had not been exploited before. These were very rich people. Their graves were very rich. And they expanded incredibly. They expanded westward all the way to Europe, to Hungary, eastward all the way to Mongolia, running over lots of groups that had come before. So genetically, we were very interested in trying to understand the population movements that occurred during this critical period. And one of the things, the first ancient DNA from Europe was really focused on the transition from hunting, gathering to farming, with farming which occurred between 8,000 or 9,000 and 8,000 years ago. And the first Europeans, all before 5,000 years ago, and the first ancient DNA samples were all mixtures of these two types of ancestry, blue which is the hunter-gatherer type of ancestry. And then after about 8,000 years ago, mostly orange farmers. And there was none of an ancestry that is ubiquitous today, which is green. So if you look in people today, there's a third ancestry type that wasn't there in Europe um, 5,000 years ago. So we knew in our laboratory in 2014 that this had to have entered Europe sometime. So in Britain, uh, where we have data, we reported data on 155 individuals from 6,000 to 3,000 years ago, you can measure the proportion of um, ancestry from first farmers of Britain who arrived in Britain about 6,000 years ago. It took them a couple of thousand years ago to get from Turkey to Britain, to, to, to a couple of thousand years, and steppe-like ancestry. And when you look at the data, you see that until 20, 4,500 years ago, all the ancestry of everybody, without exception, is um, first farmer, and then bang, at 4,500 years ago, everybody has about 90% uh, uh, ancestry from the continent. And it's a minimum 90% population replacement. Uh, uh, shortly before 4,500 years ago, the last stones of Stonehenge went up, and these first farmers had built it, and within 100 years, they didn't know that they would be replaced by these people from the continent who very shortly ended the practices that were common at places like Stonehenge. It's a 70% replacement in Germany, a 90% place replacement in Britain. And now it's up to archaeologists in dialogue with geneticists and anthropologists to figure out what's going on. So by looking at this linguistics graph, we can identify some of the various terms he used. For example, Hittite, whose empire was in Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey, which is an extinct language now but probably the first or oldest of the Aryan languages to separate from the original mother tongue. Another is Tocharian, which is here, and belongs to the people who left ancient blonde mummies in western China along the Silk Road, some of them six foot six inches tall, who populated this region of China before any East Asian phenotypes migrated to the area. And here is the modern Hindi spoken in modern India, 
and here is Vedic Sanskrit introduced into India by the Aryans several thousand years ago. Here is the Germanic branch of languages and German is also descended from the Aryans and even English that I'm speaking now is an Aryan or Indo-European language that stems from Proto-Indo-European origins, or an Aryan origin. So these languages, as Dr. Reich stated, either spread with agriculture and metals, or with domesticated animals like horses and cattle, or both, by one population, one ethnic group, or one race, if you will. And this demographic happened to have the genetic marker for blue eyes. Geneticists compared mitochondrial DNA from blue-eyed individuals in countries as diverse as Jordan, Denmark, and Turkey, concluding that people with blue eyes have a single common ancestor that lived by the Black Sea around 10,000 years ago, spreading out with agriculture. According to Professor Eiberg from the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Copenhagen, quote, the first blue-eyed humans were among the Proto-Indo-Europeans, or Aryans, who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. This helps to explain why so many of the statues of ancient Sumerian nobility have blue eyes, and why this color is revered around the ancient Mediterranean, including the many blue-eyed statues of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs and nobility. So what we find is that modern Europeans are comprised of a combination of Western hunter-gatherers who are the blue-eyed ancestors of the earliest or indigenous people of Europe, such as the Basque, a wave of dark-haired, light-skinned agriculturalists from the Middle East, and a later ironic wave of blonde, blue-eyed Indo-Europeans from the steppes. To help further illustrate how this happened, Here's a brief presentation by a colleague of Professor Reich, who just spoke, Johann Krauss, Professor of Archaeology and Paleogenetics and Director of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. And I want to talk today about a topic, a research um, project that we have been working on over the last few years, mostly together with um, David Reich's team in Harvard, but also with an uh, entire international consortium of uh, researchers where we address the question about the ancestry of um, modern Europeans by actually looking at the DNA that we can extract from skeletons from the past and see how basically the genetic makeup of Europeans have been changing over time. And our main finding, as was presented here also in the title, was that modern Europeans are best modeled or can best be seen as a mixture of three ancestral populations that are present today in all European populations. So the Neolithic transition has been a very interesting topic in archaeological research and very fascinating for many years, which is basically the transition from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle of people to a more sedentary lifestyle where people have agriculture and domesticated animals. This process, which is also called the Neolithic Revolution, this change um, in uh, uh, basically subsistence strategy, happened in Central Europe about 7,000 years ago. And it has been off, or for a long time argued whether this um, change was due to new people coming to Europe and bringing domesticated animals and wheat and agricultural products, or whether this was just culture, that was just innovation, which was transmitted from village to village, but it wasn't really people moving, but in fact it was culture moving. So there were these two models that people had suggested. One is the cultural diffusion model, which would suggest that it was actually culture that was passed on from maybe neighboring populations. And then there's the other model, which we call the demic diffusion model, which argues that there were just early people that were living like hunter-gatherers in Europe. And later on, there were new people coming to Europe. Those new people actually brought this um, technology. They brought basically domesticated animals and agriculture and the people that we see in Europe today are actually more or less those newcomers that came to Europe about 7,000 years ago. And there has been much debate about that um, in, in, in archaeology. It was very difficult to solve this question and only genetics could really help to address and, and get, give us an almost uh, definite final answer on that. And that was that there seems to have been a large migration into Europe. And here you have 
a, a time beam here starting at 6,000 before Christ to about uh, basically today. Um, and here we have those different types that you see in Europe. Different frequencies, you have a dark here, you have a certain type, then you have those orange types, yellow types, and those other types here. And what you can see that before 7,000 years before present, so about uh, 5,000 years, 6,000 years before Christ, you had in Europe only one type of mitochondrial DNA. It was the so-called U-type. That's a type that we see in all hunter-gatherers. So all hunter-gatherers that we have sequenced, which is more than 100 by now, they all have this U-type, even from the start of the Pleistocene, so the time when Neanderthals were still in Europe. But then as soon as the first farmers come to Europe with the so-called linear band ceramic, the frequency of this type of mitochondria drops basically to zero. So this type disappears. We don't see that in the people anymore. So this type of DNA disappears and a new type appears, which we then see for the next few thousand years to be a very high frequency in Europeans. Whereas this U-type is, is really, really, really far down. However, you see that this is not the only event that happened because it's not that this is how we look today, that we don't have U anymore and we only have this early farmer type, but you can actually see that over the Neolithic, there's like some other more changes. Actually, some really interesting change happens about here, about 4,500 years ago, where the frequency of the early farmers goes down and this hunter-gatherer types come up and there's this new yellow types here that are also coming up. So the frequency changes again. But 4,500 years ago, keep that in mind, that will become important later again. But then, of course, people again said, okay, this is mitochondrial DNA. This is the story of the females, which is, of course, a very important part of our population. But is that really representing the entire story? So people then would argue again, we actually need the nuclear genome and the nuclear DNA. For those modern humans, it was more challenging, so it took some time. So the first paper that came out in 2012 from Matthias Jakobsen's group and Pontus Scotland here as a PhD student working on that, they actually sequenced um, hunter-gatherers and um, an early farmer coming from Sweden. So they were found here. So the hunter-gatherers were found on, on Gotland, which is um, here in the Baltic Sea. And the, the um, early farmer was found here um, on the, on the uh, western coast of Sweden. So what you have then here is modern populations that you have presented here by dots, different parts of Europe, Italy, Russia, um, this is kind of the Near East here. And here you have those kind of genomic information, now, again over the whole nuclear genome, so basically like people did in Switzerland or London, asking people on the street, but in this case using skeletons from the past and extracting that nuclear DNA, you can see that the early farmer is actually quite distinct from those hunter-gatherers. The early farmer looks basically like us today, looks more a bit like a Sardinian or like a Basque, not so much like a Central European, but for sure not like a modern Swedish person. And that was something really interesting here because it told us, okay, they are definitely very different people. So it's probably people that migrated into that region bringing agriculture. However, they're not to 100% ancestral to the modern Swedish people. In fact, those hunter-gatherers look more like those modern Swedish people than those early farmers do, which tells us that there must have been uh, some more to that story. It's not only that the people come and then the people stay and they have the agriculture and they stay there until today, and this is the Swedish, and that happened in other parts of Europe, but there must have been some more complexity to that story. Then the other big paper that came out in the same year was the genome of this fellow here. Some of you might recognize him, kind of looks from some sort of 1980s horror movie, um, but he's actually the Iceman, right? So there was this, this, this Tyrolean Iceman that was discovered um, about 20 years ago um, in, a, in a glacier in the Alps. And what people found was that genetically he looked, okay, I mean, comparing it to different European populations here, you see this is the different, different populations, different parts of Europe. This is actually Southern Europe here, this is Northern Europe, Eastern Europe. He actually has the highest similarity, extremely high actually, to people that live today in Corsica and Sardinia. So if you would just get his DNA like on the street in Switzerland, you would actually think that he is from Sardinia or Corsica. Which then of course again is a bit weird because certainly he didn't travel from Corsica to the Alps. It's pretty unlikely because people didn't, were not so mobile during the time. It might have been possible, but it's I think uh, quite unlikely that he actually was born in Sardinia. Um, 
But in fact, it tells us that those, those farmers, you belong to the Copper Age farmers, so the kind of middle to na late Neolithic farmers, that those farmers were probably looking different to the people that live in Tyrol today. And another um, very, very important um, story that appeared um, only, I think it was in 2013, so, so two years ago now, and that was a story which made the thing even more complex. What people had analyzed in, in, in this paper was an ancient fossil, an ancient human, so that's work that was done in Copenhagen by Esker Villaslav's group, where they sequenced a little boy um, that was, I think, about 12 years old when he died, and that was 17,000 years ago very, very long time ago, close to the Lake Baikal. They sequenced his DNA, and they compared his DNA, again, to different populations that live in different parts of, of Europe, Siberia, as well as Native Americans so in the Americas today. And what you can see on this plot, it might be a bit hard to see it from the back, but this is basically Europe, this is Native Americans, and this is where this kind of multi-child fa falls in. It doesn't fall with Siberians, but it falls somewhere in between modern Europeans and Native Americans. They also did some more studies and some more uh, co complex statistics. And what they could basically show is this is kind of populations that would have a high genetic affinity based on the color, so warmer color, more affinity, um, kind of colder color, less affinity. You can actually see that populations in the Americas today, as well as here in uh, the Beringian region, as well as in Europe, have a genetic affiliation or affinity to this 17,000-year-old um, boy from Siberia. <coughs> so what does that tell us? It's an interesting story. So what it actually tells us is that there's a genetic link between Native Americans and Europeans. Europeans are closer related genetically to Native Americans than they are to Eastern Asians. So there has been some sort of ancestor in the past that gave us some DNA, which is also found in Native Americans' DNA. So there's some genetic link here. What we have down here are our early farmers. Our early farmers, indeed, again, look like certain populations in Europe. And no surprise, we've seen that before with the Iceman, they look like Sardinians. So people in Sardinia look genetically like the first farmers. And that has been replicated now many times. So this is basically people here from Sardinia they're almost indistinguishable from people that were the early farmers that came maybe about 7,000 years ago to Europe. However, the rest of the Europeans, they look somehow different. They kind of fall kind of in between here and there, so hunter-gatherers and Near Eastern populations, but they also kind of moved towards this kind of direction in this plot, right? They're kind of like moved towards um, uh, this upper part here of the plot. What do we have at the upper part of the plot? We have the Moltacha, so this child from Lake Baikal. And this made us to actually propose a third component that we have in Europe, which is the early farmers, the hunter-gatherers, but then this, what we would call North Eurasian, ancient North Eurasians. So this link between Native Americans and Europeans, that is actually kind of responsible for this kind of upward movement of these Europeans, and is basically found um, in, in, or best represented by this uh, Malta child from um, Siberia. Basically, modern Europeans are best represented by a genetic mixture of those three components, North Eurasians, West Eurasians, basically those hunter-gatherers, and then those early farmers. So that basically then was this model that we developed, that we have this three-way mixture um, of modern Europeans with these three um, genetic components. So in summary for this model, we would then suggest with kind of the recent Holocene history of European populations, that about 9,000 years ago, early farmers come to Europe. On their way to Europe, they mix with certain populations, hunter-gatherer populations, potentially in East um, uh, Europe, because we have a little bit of hunter-gatherer DNA in the early farmers. About 7,000 years ago, they arrive in Central Europe. In Scandinavia, we have something else going on. I don't want to go too much into detail. But then, less than 7,000 years ago, a new genetic component comes from the East, which is this North Eurasian component. Why do I say less than 7,000 years ago? Because neither the hunter-gatherer from Lochbur nor the early farmer had this component. They do not have that. But every European population today 
has this component. So therefore we know it was not around 7,000 years ago in Central Europe, and it must have arrived later. And that was, that was basically the end of, of the story of this paper that we published in October. We said, OK, we have those three genetic components. But it kind of really bothered us to not know when this component actually arrived. What do we have in this plot is one population that we also have studied, which is the so-called Yamnaya. Yamnaya is actually a population that archaeologists have been interested in a very, very long time because it was a population that was present north of the Black Sea in the so-called Pontic Steppe. It was this large region where those pastoralists were living and there was a hypothesis already in the 19th century that those people at some point came to Europe and brought potentially Indo-European languages. That was basically the homeland supposed to be of the Indo-European languages was some hypothesis that people had been uh, discussing already in the late 19th century and had still be then, um, been around uh, a lot in the 20th century. Um, however, this is a population that we find uh, in the past north of the Black Sea, so not in Central Europe. And this is also something we can, again, present in some sort of um, admixture-like analysis where we have with the three different colors here, those three different genetic components. So with the orange here, we have the um, uh, early Neolithic, middle Neolithic, so the early farmer component. In blue here, we have the hunter-gatherer. And here, you have the late Neolithic, as well as the early Bronze Age, as well as those Yamnaya populations. So this is all the Yamnaya here. Those are the populations in the Bronze Age, hunter-gatherers, early farmers. So what you see is the hunter-gatherers, they're all blue here. They don't have this green. They don't have these uh, Yamnaya components. The early Neolithic farmers, they also do not have this Yamnaya component. The Yamnaya have this green component very strong, as well as the corded ware. The corded ware, those people that were in Central Europe about 5,000 years ago, or 4,500 years ago, they basically genetically look almost e exactly like the Yamnaya. But what we see here in this plot is also represented here. Genetically, Yamnaya and corded ware are basically almost indistinguishable. And that basically led us to the hypothesis to think that the corded ware probably is very close related to Yamnaya, which some archaeologists have also suggested in the past. They come probably in some large migration from the Pontic steppe north of the Black Sea to Central Europe. And they bring this green component that we find in people today, that we find in the Bronze Age, we find in the late Neolithic, but we don't find in the early Neolithic and we don't find it in hunter-gatherers. So basically, this kind of shift towards the north, this kind of shift towards the north Eurasian component happened with the corded ware about 4,500 years ago. So that basically lets us to fill this kind of number here. So we can now say that this component, this kind of north Eurasian component, came with Yamnaya, with the corded ware, about 4,500 years ago to Europe. And in fact, we could show that it replaced this middle Neolithic people that were living here in actually parts of, of Germany at the time, um, or today Germany at that time, the Germany didn't exist. Um, they replaced this population almost completely, almost 100% replacement. Whatever happened, whatever those people, the court where culture was kind of more sophisticated, more successful, maybe better in warfare. We know they had wheels and wagons. They had horses, um, at least in a higher percent than the, 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 than the other early farmers. Somehow there were kind of a mass migration into this region and then um, over time actually mixed up with the people that were living in this region. And this was a major finding because it tells us that there was a migration that we really didn't know so much about before. We knew or we had at least a good idea that there was this early Neolithic people, the first farmers coming to Europe 7,000 years ago. We had a good idea that this happened. But what we didn't know was that there was another large migration happening in the late Neolithic, the new people coming in. And that had direct implications, and also for some hypotheses which are relang uh, related to uh, the uh, languages, uh, especially to the Indo-European languages. There are two main hypotheses that people have been um, discussing in the past about where and when Indo-European languages um, came to Europe. There's the so-called Anatolian hypothesis, and there's the Pontic steppe or Kurgan hypothesis. And one hypothesis states that with the first farmers, nine to 7,000 years ago, the Indo-European languages came from Anatolia, came to Europe, and then basically spread in Europe, and later on then also spread 
um, towards um, uh, Central and Southern Asia. And the other hypothesis is the Kurgan hypothesis or Pontic step hypothesis, which already goes back to some hypothesis about Urheimat from, from, from uh, some old, old German archaeologists from the 19th century, um, suggesting that it was rather from kind of the northern, uh, north of the um, Black Sea here, the so-called Pontic step, from this Pontic step um, some time ago, they said, well, 5,000 years ago, so 4,500 years ago, um, there was this movement together with the corded where those languages might have spread into Europe and then spread into um, different parts of Europe and also um, in the other direction towards Persia as well as to um, Central Asia. So those two hypotheses are basically both in some ways supported by our data because we can show that there was a large migration 7,000 years ago but there was also a large migration 4,500 years ago. So we can at least say that based on the genetics, both hypotheses are equally likely. My kind of last point I would like to make is because we have so many sequences, now a hundred ancient humans, we can look again at the phenotypes over time. And that was actually quite interesting because now we can look at some more phenotypes, not just the blue eyes and the skin color, but we could actually also see that there were certain genes that were changing in time since hunter-gatherers towards people today. And they were not just the blue eyes, where we said, like the hunter-gatherers, they all had blue eyes. Over time, blue eyes go actually down. The kind of lowest number of blue eyes we have in the middle Neolithic. So probably the farmers coming in from, from uh, the Near East, they had probably uh, not blue eyes. So basically had a lower proportion, therefore. But later on, the kind of researches here, when the people come from the Pontic Steppe, they had probably a larger component of, of blue eyes again. And then it kind of drops down uh, to what we have today um, in Actually, yeah, it's actually more or less constant than, um, uh, until today. The one thing which shows the strongest selection actually of all the genes almost we know of, which has really changed in frequency tremendously, is actually almost surprisingly within the last um, few thousand years, that is a gene which is um, basically giving you the ability to drink milk when you're an adult, so you're, that you're lactose tolerant. So actually most people and basically all mammals cannot digest milk when they're adults. Because usually the lactase gene gets shut down when you get older, which makes a lot of sense because the mother doesn't want to give milk for the rest of their life, right? Um, I'm sure there's some empathy here in the room for that. Um, but what happened in Europe was that there was a gene which had basically zero frequency in the hunter-gatherers. Early farmers also didn't have it, even though they had cows. They couldn't digest milk when they were adults. But then around the time when the Pontic steppe people come in, so this kind of migration from the east, this kind of gene comes potentially in. We're not really sure if it comes in during the time, but then we see it the first time. And it rose in frequency a lot to about 60% in Europeans today. So it's like a tremendous shift from here to there within only about 4,000 years. Right? This is actually such a strong selection, it's incredible. It's like basically you have way more offspring if you can digest milk when you're an adult than if you don't. And it has been very strong and um, has uh, come up in frequency here. And people have also seen that since the 1970s, basically, as one of the genes being under selection and um, coming up again and again. And we can see that in this data again, that it actually comes pretty late. People had suggested before um, that it was something that evolved about 6,000 years ago with farming, but it seems to be something that actually came later on at the early Bronx Age and then um, mostly during the Iron Age. There's like dozens of genes, sometimes hundreds of genes or hundreds of variants that actually cause a certain phenotype. And one phenotype is actually height. Height is a very complex trait. But what we also see, which is quite interesting, that those Yamnaya actually had an increase in height. They were selected for being tall. Uh, so it's quite an interesting story. Those people had horses, they had wagons, they came from the east, potentially brought languages, and were really tall warriors. So it's like, it sounds like a story from the 19th century, but unfortunately, oh, somehow it's also uh, supported by the genetic data. And this DNA sequencing, this is really the key to everything that we do. And this is also the key to what I will be talking today about and the big boom that some of you might have recognized in this field over the last, let's say, 10 years, when we really see in almost every month a new paper in Nature or Science which is related to ancient DNA. Because these new technologies that came on the market allow you to sequence DNA in very, very short time for very, very little money. 10 years ago or 12 years ago, it took the first genome project about 10 years to generate the first human genome. It cost about $2 billion 
to produce the first human genome. Today, this machine is doing it in a couple of hours for less than 500 euro. So things have changed a lot, so this massive throughput. In fact, my parents and also my girlfriend got a genome sequence for Christmas last year. Um, <laughs> I also had my DNA sequence through AncestryDNA.com, which allowed me to download the raw sequence DNA as a zip file, which I then uploaded to several other sites offering analysis, such as this one, which validated much of the findings in this presentation. Although my mother is German and my father, who passed away last year, was Iranian, my results list me as 93% European which speaks to the genetic overlap between places like Iran and Germany, both receiving admixture from Indo-European or Aryan migrations about 4,500 years ago. My Y chromosome inherited from my paternal or father's side is R1A, which is sometimes regarded as the Aryan haplogroup, including on published scientific papers, such as this one from 2012, quote, haplogroup R1A as the Proto-Indo-Europeans and the legendary Aryans witnessed by the DNA of their current descendants. The rest of my summary includes 4% Asian, which speaks to the influx of Aryan populations from Western Asia, as reflected in Viking genomes that were sequenced and also show West Asian admixture. And I had 1% Native American, presumably from the ancient link between Solutrian Europeans and the Americas. And finally, no African DNA, no Jewish DNA, and no Oceanian DNA. That said, I'm also lactose tolerant, meaning I can drink milk as an adult, which is a trait that shows up in Europeans via the Aryans during the Holocene. I'm six foot four inches tall, which was a trait that became prominent in Europe around 4,500 years ago. I have blue eyes and blondish hair. And even though neither of my parents had blue eyes, my mothers were green and my fathers were brown, showing that they were carriers of the recessive traits. This episode was much longer than usual, and now I'm hungry. So now that the ducks and geese are fed, I'm gonna grab a bendejo roll on the way home. If you like my videos, consider checking out my books. Species with Amnesia, Our Forgotten History, Gods with Amnesia, Subterranean Worlds of Inner Earth, The Occult Secrets of Vril, and 1666, Redemption Through Sin. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist my published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.